In just about smack dab the middle of the world map is the icon of a large truck piled high with barrels. We find this site due north of Huntersville. We can reach it by taking the highway north until it splits left into Highway 104. My camp was actually near to this location, so I arrived from the north. This put me out on top of a ledge overlooking the Emmett Mountain Disposal Site. After a quick survey, we see a few ghouls. Nearby, we see that a cement wall at one time blocked a path between these two large rocks, but it has since been smashed. In the rubble on the ground before the wall, we see a sign. Restricted area, no trespassing. U.S. government something. Yeah. Upon entering, we immediately see that something is terribly wrong here. For a disposal site, they haven't been doing a very good job of disposing of their toxic waste. We find irradiated barrels and pools of nuclear material all over this disposal site. Since I came from the north side, let's head around to the southern side to start exploring from the entrance. Along the way, we pass a number of boxcars and ruined vehicles. There's a Pulowski Preservation Shelter being transported on the back of one of these trucks. This must be the truck we saw in the icon on the map. Moving to the southern gate, we see a badge on the wall of the security office. Department of Energy, United States of America. Caution, radiation hazard. Heading inside, we can kill a rad roach. We find a cooler on top of some filing cabinets, an ammo box on the ground next to it, but the terminals on the security desks are all blasted out. We find a lunch pail and one footlocker. That's it for the security office. Heading back towards the gate, we see a sign on the side of the wall, U.S. Department of Energy Emmett Mountain Site Nuclear Waste Disposal. How did things get so messed up here that we find toxic waste in pools on the ground outside? We see some machinery to the right, heading up the stairs to this platform. We see a concrete hut. Heading around behind it, we can kill another ghoul. There are large pipes sticking out of the ground, revealing that there is indeed some sort of facility below. On the back porch of this building, we see a miner's corpse draped over a handrail, and then heading inside, we finally find a working terminal on a desk, the Emmett Mountain Disposal Terminal. Current site manager, Amelia Reynolds. And here we find a number of weekly logs, starting with 1A, site supervisor, Wesley Wachowski. These logs are intended to track the progress of nuclear waste storage at this new facility. Disposal cells 1 through 8 have been fully excavated and structural supports are in place. Each cell is rated to hold 128 55 gallon drums of nuclear waste, which puts our capacity at 1,024 drums. We already have a batch that was delivered this week waiting for storage, so it looks like we're open for business. In the next one, 2A, Seismos went nuts this morning, and all the cameras in Disposal Cell 2 are dead. Looks like the support snapped, and we've had a cave collapse. Two of my guys were in that cell doing inspections, but there's been no sign of them since the accident. When we started excavating the cell, the Geiger counter spiked, which meant we were looking at a containment breach. At this point, I'm declaring the trapped workers as deceased, and we'll have to seal the area. I've contacted the foreman at Federal Disposal Field HZ-21 for assistance. A cave collapsed into disposal cell 2. But how? Didn't they have safeguards in place to prevent that? In log 3A, even after sealing disposal cell 2, we're still reading high levels of radiation. Worse still, most of my staff are starting to show signs of radiation poisoning. I sent requests up the ladder to the energy department, but all they came back with were two medical doctors who had more questions than answers. They kept poking and prodding at my men, asking them how they feel, but not really treating them. I'm starting to think we're being used as lab rats to test the long-term effects of radiation sickness on humans. It's ridiculous. I'm driving up to Washington tomorrow to give them a piece of my mind. Uh-oh, we already know what happens to people like that in the Fallout universe. Sure enough, in the next one, 4A, Site Supervisor Donald Clark. I've been assigned to Emmett Mountain to replace outgoing Site Manager Wesley Wachowski. I'm not sure why he left his assignment so abruptly, and frankly, I don't care. 
This is a big promotion for me, and I couldn't be happier. My first order of business will be to go over every square inch of this facility and look for any deficient construction or equipment failures that could be contributing to the accidents they've been suffering. I'm also looking forward to working with the doctors we have on site that are helping monitor the employees' health. Nice to have them watching our backs. Well, Donald sure arrived on site, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Let's see how long that lasted. In the next one, 5A... After an extensive survey of the site, I can confirm that the accident in Disposal Cell 2 was caused by deficient construction materials. They used wooden supports, for goodness sake. How anyone would expect these to not dry rot under these conditions is absolutely beyond me. I've recommended that all seven remaining Disposal Cells receive metal reinforcements immediately. Beyond that, we've lost 30 of the 55-gallon drums of waste in the collapse, and they're likely seeping into the groundwater. It's absolutely infuriating that this facility was constructed so poorly. I think I'll have a nice long chat with my supervisor back at DC. Oh no, Donald, not you too. And <laughs> sure enough, in the next one, 6A, Site Supervisor Amelia Reynolds. I've been assigned to Emmett Mountain to replace outgoing site manager Donald Clark. Everything at Emmett Mountain is running smoothly and within acceptable parameters. I've canceled all the ridiculous work orders created by Donald Clark, and I will carefully search for other ways to cut unnecessary costs. Brilliant. Well, we begin to understand why we find toxic materials scattered all over the place. Whatever government branch was running this facility was willfully incompetent, firing their only competent employees and replacing them with do-nothing dregs. After looting a lunch pail by a desk and a footlocker by a door, we can go into the door to find a bit of a storage room. Here we find an explosives crate and another footlocker. Back out to the main floor, we find a bunch more containers, filing cabinets and consoles. There's a duffel bag on a storage shelf and another storage room to the south. In the second storage room, we find a metal box, a footlocker and a toolbox. There's some boiled water on a storage shelf, and that about does it for this building. Heading out the eastern door, we can go around to the southern side of the building where we find a Nuka-Cola machine filled with Nuka-Cola. There are some buildings to the southwest, but first we can follow a trail uphill to the southeast. Here we see a ruined picker-up truck with another minor corpse. At the top, we find a small shack. The door is locked with a skill level one lock. After picking it, we find some booze and scrap, a toolbox and a lunch pail. The Fallout 76 official strategy guide says that there's supposed to be a bobblehead against the wall across from the door to this shack, but I came back here three times looking for it and I never found it. Although one time I came back here, I found a whole bunch of rare power armor mods sitting on the shelves. So go figure. Moving outside, we can pass some machinery to the northern side of the building. Here we find a footlocker under a scrap table. But that's it for up here. So hopping down from this ledge, we can start to explore the two final buildings. The first is a large warehouse. Heading through the western door, we see some shelving to the south. Here we can find a randomized mod and some bobby pins. Moving down a level, we find more toxic barrels stacked up and another shelf with another randomized mod. The room is piled high with toxic barrels, and there's not much else here. So leaving, we can explore the final building. Caution, hazardous materials reads a sign. Inside, we find a few lockers and more irradiated barrels littering the ground. On the eastern side of this building, we find some chemical showers and some sinks. The strategy guide says that there should be a bobblehead in one of the sinks, but again, I never found it the three times I came here to check. At the southeastern end of this building, we find a door leading inside the disposal site. We arrive in a large concrete room. We see a weapons workbench. Turning left, we see a door, and on the other side of the door... <laughs> This was a shower and bathroom. We find a skill level zero locked chem cooler on the ground and a selection of hazmat suits on top of and inside the lockers. <laughs> Turning north, we see a doorway leading to decontamination, but it appears to be turned off. Walking through, we find the button at the opposite side. Punching it, we can remove our rads for free. Retracing our steps through the locker room, we arrive back at the entrance. We find an ammo box against a wall to the west. Another one by some piled up toxic waste barrels in the middle of this room. And turning around, we see a fenced off portion of this level with ghouls walking around. We see the opening to the northeast. 
Before heading up, we see a tunnel to the north and a button on the side of the wall, pushing it. Uh-oh, that can't be good. But nothing appears to happen. Heading up the stairs to that platform where we killed the ghoul, we can move to the southern end, where we find a security door with a suit of power armor inside. Here I found a partial suit of T-45. Heading out of the security closet, we can move northeast where we find a fusion generator. Someone had already looted the fusion core. On the north side of this room, we find a big double door leading to a storage room. Here we find all sorts of broken down scrap on a shelf. And on the bottom of the northern shelf, we find a prototype hazmat suit. There's a hole in the wall leading to a bit of a cave. We'll explore that in a minute. At the eastern end of this room, we find a lunchbox on a table next to another terminal. But this one has all the same logs we read on the terminal outside. Lying on the desktop next to the terminal is a copy of Grognak the Barbarian 3, Jungle of the Bad Babies, Nate and Nora's favorite. With this room clear, we can head to that hole in the wall that we saw to the northwest. This brings us to a path that leads us downhill. Along the way, we spot a bunch of brain fungus. It appears to open up into a large glowing room. We see a nook to the northwest with a petrified corpse inside, but this is a dead end. We find a bunch more brain fungus on the walls and one more petrified corpse. Next to him, we find that the path goes deeper. At the very end, we find a pool. Moving inside, we see toxic barrels embedded in rubble to the left. Moving out, we appear to have found the main tunnel. After killing a rad roach, we can turn west and run up the hill. This leads to a crossroads intersecting the main tunnel that leads all the way back to where we came. We know this because the alarm we turned on is still playing. Turning south, we can run up just to make sure. And yeah, this does a complete loop. This was right where we were. Okay, now we know where we are. Turning around, we can race back down this path to continue exploring. At the junction, we can go left or right. There is a little nook directly ahead of us, but all we find here are petrified corpses and the corpse of a miner. We'll turn east for now to go back to the path that the hole in the wall let out onto, just to make sure we've explored everything. We find more toxic barrels stacked up in a corner to the north. Moving east, we find another minor corpse draped over toxic barrels still on a pallet. And as we get closer... Oh, you're kidding me. Okay. Since when do they burrow? Backing up just a bit, we can pull out a more powerful long-range weapon. Okay, Chameleon Deathclaws burrowing underground. That's a first. I found a Gatling laser on this guy. After looting, we can move back east to where this guy leapt out of the ground. Directly behind his burrow spot, we find an End of Dungeon steamer trunk. The path east is a dead end, but we find another minor corpse and yet another to the south. Are these the remains of the pre-war government workers who worked here? It must be, because this wasn't a mine. The corpses appear to be labeled incorrectly. It may have been a mine at one time, but it was clearly turned into a toxic disposal site. With this end clear, we can turn west, head up the hill to the junction, and continue downhill to the west. This brings us to a flooded portion where we find a number of nooks. There's a nook to the south, filled with toxic barrels. Here we find a skill level one locked explosives crate. Turning around, we find another petrified corpse amongst even more toxic barrels. And here we find a duffel bag. Down here, the alarm we triggered is still blaring. Looks like a wall has begun to partially collapse. Moving forward, we see that this entire room is partially blocked in with rubble. And worse yet, the toxic barrels that were stored here have been popped open, their contents spilling out. Well, wait a minute, let's see. This doesn't look like toxic waste. The contents of these barrels were... Super mutant body parts? What? We find a super mutant right hand, a super mutant head in the barrel, a super mutant lower arm and upper arm. These barrels weren't filled with nuclear material. They were filled with chopped up super mutant bodies. But wait a minute. These barrels were buried here before the war. How could this be? 
The only explanation is that this is where West Tech was disposing of their test subjects captured from Huntersville. And now we understand why the doctors who came here were less interested in treating the workers here and more interested in observing them. Perhaps they not only wanted to see what would happen when they were exposed to radiation, but also to see what would happen if they were exposed to the remains of people infected with FEV. Would the virus spread to the workers? We remember from reading the terminal entries at West Tech that all of their test subjects, with a few exceptions, ended up dying. We found some of their bodies splayed out on exam tables and floating in pods, but these experiments had been going on for quite some time. Looks like West Tech, working with the government, chose to dispose of their victims here at Emmett Mountain. And this begins to explain exactly why it was built so poorly. It was built to cave in. They didn't want everyday Americans learning of what they had done to the people of Huntersville. They didn't want the existence of FEV and the super mutants to ever get out, and yet they had to dispose of these corpses. I guess an incinerator wasn't on the table, and so they commandeered this disposal site, knowing that it was just a matter of time before the cells they supported with wooden beams began to collapse, and filled it to the brim with chopped up super mutant body parts. And with that, we fully explore Emmett Mountain Disposal. What are your thoughts about what we've learned? Why do you think the government chose to bury them here instead of simply incinerating them? You think that would be the quickest way to get rid of their body trail. But perhaps the West Tech Research Facility wasn't set up with an incinerator and they had no way to burn the bodies. Maybe they were in a hurry. And so they tossed them in the closest place they could find. After all, Emmett Mountain is just north of Huntersville, which itself is really close to West Tech. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish many videos each and every week here on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you're still not getting YouTube notifications, you may want to try following me on Twitter. I manually update Twitter every single time I publish a new piece of content. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs you can't find anywhere else. My designs come in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.